Live from the Business Radio X studio in Atlanta, it's time for Dental Business Radio. Brought to you by Practice Quotient. Practice Quotient bridges the gap between the provider and payer communities. Now here's your host, Patrick O'Rourke. Hi there. Welcome to Dental Business Radio, friends of the dental industry. This is your host, Patrick O'Rourke. And we appreciate you listening to the show. It's brought to you by Practice Quotient. Practice Quotient, PPO Negotiations and Analysis. You could do it yourself. You could have an office manager do it. You can also do your own taxes and represent yourself in a court of law. Doesn't mean it's a good idea. So if there's a lot of money on the table, you should call, give Practice Quotient a call. So with that, I want to welcome our guest, Dr. Jesse Jakubowski of Bay Center Jaw Surgery. Hello. Thank you very much for having me, Patrick. It's a pleasure to see you again, Jesse. And Dr. Frank Yee of Coastal Virginia OMS. How are you, Frank? I'm doing great, Pat. Thanks for having us. Oh, it's my pleasure. So, um, you know, as I was kind of talking to you guys at the beginning, you know, prior to the show, you guys have a relationship um, with each other. I'm, I'm not sure which one of you I met first, actually. Um, and you have some other uh, compadres in, in your circle. Um, and so... I talk to a lot of oral surgery practices and I've spoken to many, many of them across the country. And there's, I consider you guys to be kind of the young guns of growing OMS practices. So you've already done it. You've established yourself and you, you know, I'm sure you've learned quite a bit along the way. And so that's really what the theme of the show is. Um, How did you guys meet? So Frank and I uh, were co-residents in residency uh, at Nova Southeastern University, Broward General. Um, So we met, oh, geez, that we would have started residency in 09. So we probably met at interviews in 08. And uh, we spent four years side by side uh, in Fort Lauderdale. Um, And so we uh, became pretty good buddies at that point. And I would say, you know, to this day, we probably talk at least by text, almost on a daily basis um, about work and patients and things of that nature. Gotcha. Uh, I think that that's terrific. We all need others around us that are going through the same things, Uh, you know, as a business owner, entrepreneur, um, you guys have it uh, a little, little bit tougher even because it's like, well, Hey, you're, you're a partner, you're an owner. So you need to understand all the aspects of the business. You know, you're the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, the website guy, the HR guy. Um, you know, you need to understanding the building, but you also, you need to put patients to sleep and make sure that you're doing quality, you know, you're delivering quality care all at one time, you know, so that can be somewhat challenging. Is that, would that be a correct assumption? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, you know, you, you learn all the stuff to, to be an oral surgeon in, in residency, you know, to you can learn how to take wisdom teeth out, put implants in, but no one ever teaches you the business side of, of running a practice. No one teaches you the HR stuff, staff management. So it's, for me, it was kind of a learn on the go. Mm-hmm. You, you know, what cracks me up is uh, the one when I did the chat on your website, I was like, hello. Um, does this work? And then Frank answered and he's like, is this Patrick? And I was like, is this Frank? Are you answering your own chat? And he's like, yeah, I just want to make sure everything works fine. <laughs> and I'm like, that's me. I want, I'm kind of do the same thing too. Right. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so what, what do you think is, what are some of the challenges that you've overcame? Either one of you feel free. Well, I think in general, like Frank said, you know, they, they teach you how to do the surgery and how to take care of patients, and uh, but they don't teach you how to, to run a business. So I, I don't know that it's overcoming in a challenge, but it's it's definitely, you know, learning a lot more than just the basics of, you know, going to work, seeing patients and going home. You know, you spend just as much time on the business end and, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how to run a base, uh, business, how to manage staff. Um, you know, the insurance end, which obviously you came in and helped us out on that side tremendously. Um, but, you know, just learning all of those things. And, you know, here, you know, we're a little bit over seven years out of residency. And I would say it took five years probably to, to figure out, you know, what you're doing from a business standpoint before you could say, all right, I could comfortably do this on my own. 
Um, and, and that's just something that, you know, it'd be nice to, to have some sort of education on that prior to, to leaving residency, but it's not really offered in, you know, dentistry, medicine. Nobody gets that, that mm-hmm. training until you're out on your own. Concur. Frank, thoughts? Completely agree. I mean, I think the biggest stress uh, as an oral surgeon, as a business owner, is not so much the oral surgery side, not so much the putting the patients to sleep and, and doing the surgeries and taking care of the patients. It's more of all the other business stuff, keeping staff happy, uh, keeping keeping the practice afloat, especially during this COVID time. Holy cow, we were shut down for two months, uh, you know, trying to, trying to navigate through that. What a struggle that was. That was the most stressful part of our, our job. I think if we could all just come on and do what we are trained to do and take care of patients, it'd be a lot easier. But like Jesse said, I mean, we, we learned on, on the go and it took us what, four or five years to finally get comfortable to where we're at. Uh, and the beauty of you know, Jesse and I's friendship is we're, we're always talking with one another, text messaging with one another and, and, and bouncing ideas of each other. So that's the beauty of uh, our friendship. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I feel the same way as Jesse. Yeah. No, well, there's, you know, when I started this business, um, you know, I came from corporate America and they were like, well, it, you know, five years, entrepreneur takes you five years. And I was like, Psh, whatever, I'll get this done in two years, five years goes by. And then you're like, whoa, all right. And now I know what they're talking about. You know, um, there's just a lot, you don't know what you don't know. And, you know, you get in there and there's a lot of things that kind of suck your time, can distract you. Um, what, what do you think is the important part of being an oral surgeon that you aren't taught? Is this aspect the most important thing that you wish were, was there? Or is there some other stuff that you feel like is it critical from an education perspective? I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? I can what, up for a second. what do you think is the most important part of being an oral surgeon that you aren't taught in school? Um, you know, kind of like we talked about it, I think a lot of it is, um, you know, how you treat people and, and how you deal with people. Now, you learn some of that in residency, um, but it, it's more than just the patients. Um, you know, you come out and uh, you just have to treat people right. Um, you have to treat your staff right. Uh, you have to treat your referrals right. You definitely have to treat your patients right and, and really what's, do what's best for, for them and and kind of go from there. And, um, you know, it, it's really, it's about people a lot more than you would ever think, you know, it's about relationships, um, and developing those relationships. And if you have strong relationships with your staff and your patients and your referrals, uh, and you care about people, um, then I think you'll do well regardless. Fair golden rule. I like that. I completely agree with Jesse. I think it's all about relationships. It's not uh, just relationships with patients and uh, staff and referrals, but, you know, we've spent a few minutes here talking about the business side of, of our practice and how to be successful. You know, if someone taught you, Hey, um, develop relationships with other professionals uh, that are either one insurance minded accountants, uh, attorneys, if you get a successful network, a successful relationship with all those people, you'll you'll be successful in practice. Gotcha. And so as you your five years pass now, and so oral surgeons also have you guys it takes a little bit longer to get through school, then you have to do residency. Now you have a business. And so now you turn a corner and now do you feel like you're hitting the gas? Um well it, well well, Frank, you know, and I kind of know the answer to this. So it's like you had one practice, you're, uh, you're an associate, you become a partner, and now you're like, hmm, how am I going to grow? Right. And so do you feel like you turned the corner? And how are you, are you mashing the gas pedal or are you just trying to go to speed limit? Describe I'm it. Always, me, I'm always trying to mash the gas pedal as fast as I can, you know. Uh, <laughs> that's just the type of guy I am. But I, as far as, uh, I think I'm still learning it every single day, right? You know, uh, there's always a new challenge that that I that I'm met with every day. I mean, just recently, you know, we've we're having problems with our practice management software system, and uh, to jump from that software system to another is just a whole, you know, different. It, it, it's it's something you learn something every day, but I feel like I'm comfortable enough to know, hey, uh, 
what, what business ventures I want to start getting into, right? Like you kind of mentioned, I started off as just one practice, one office, got to two, was 50% owner. Now I'm 100% owner. And then we went from two offices to three offices. So I feel like I'm kind of getting the comfort level uh, of, of the business aspect of it where now I'm ready just to kind of take off. Gotcha. So do you have like a, a mogul clothes too? You have to get special clothes in order to be a mogul. Oh, yeah. Wow. So yeah. you've been reading Mogul magazine, I hope. <laughs> That'd be great. Wow, very good. So, Jesse, your situation, you've got, you. we walked into three successful practices in Pinellas County, uh, Pinellas County, Florida, part of the Tampa Bay region. Go Bucks. Uh, and Go Bucks. That's right. And we'll give a little shout out to all of our friends and family back home in Tampa in a little bit. Um, for those of you who don't know, your host, Patrick O'Rourke, is a Tampanian. I'm born and raised in the city of Tampa. That's correct. Proud of it. Um, so, Jesse, you you have six. You guys were when I met you guys already, you know, kind of you had a nice machine going. Right. And so now it's even nicer. So where, as you're pivoting and you turn this corner and you see some open ground, COVID's been a little speed bump. That's for all of us, but you know, I think that's just temporary and a test of our, um, you know, test of our gumption, if you will. Um, so I don't want to get too deep into COVID, but I know it's a challenge and we all have a rut, but you're still the, the future is bright. So what do you see as you pivot? Yeah. So I had a little different situation than, than Frank did. Um, I joined a group practice, um, seven years ago. Uh, it was two practices pretty much right after I joined, we bought a third practice, uh, became partner within about a year, um, from that point. Um, and yes, I'm blessed and very happy and lucky to get the partners that I got that treated me fairly and equally from day one. And I walked into a relatively well-oiled machine, uh, not that it's a machine, but uh, you get the point. I worked mm-hmm. in, walked into a very nice practice, a very well-respected practice that I'm very happy with. And so, um, you know, we continue to be partners to the day. There's three of us. Um, you know, this past summer, uh, we did bring on an associate as well. So now there's four of us, uh, with the three locations, uh, and we'll always be a group practice. Um, you know, there's, you know, well, as soon as our new guy is ready, uh, you can join as, as partner and, um, we'll keep doing what we're doing. Um, you know, and, and the practice is, is doing well, you know, whether or not we'll grow or we'll expand that, uh, you know, I think that's obviously a, a conversation I, would have with my partners as opportunities arise. Um, but at this point, I don't think there are any plans for that. Uh, just to continue, you know, working hard and, you know, the future is unpredictable. And so, you know, I'm always, you know, kind of the same way as, as Frank, I'd like to keep my foot on the gas and, and just be prepared for anything that might get thrown at us. Um, but, you know, very, you know, very happy with, you know, uh, what's been handed to me, um, you know, as far as this location. And, and my partners. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, you guys already have three and a very good footprint with an established reputation. You know, you don't want to grow just for growth sakes. Uh, in my, in my humble opinion, um, you know, we're not growth oriented. We're a bit of a be- boutique. I hate that word, but it's kind of true. Um, you know, we're not volume based and it's just, it makes it to where you're able to pick and choose and, and take, only projects that you are sure that you're going to be successful with and work with people that you want to work with and not, you know, run around with your hair on fire, you know? So that's one part for me that I've learned over, over the years is that there's a little bit of a balance, you know, I got two small kids. I know you guys have kids too. Um, and you know, professional fulfillment is important, but you know, one of the reasons I assume is true for you guys too, that we all work, right. It's to provide for our families and, be good fathers, right? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, and so I kudos to both of you though, too, because you're both still very involved in your professional community. Frank, you were the, um, are you the president now of the S Virginia society oral maxillofacial surgeons? Or do Currently you- I'm the yeah. vice president of the Virginia society of oral maxillofacial surgeons. Next year it'll be president. Gotcha. Very yeah. good. 
So, and I've sat on some boards before. I mean, it's a commitment, it's like multiple years because you got to go like secretary, treasurer, vice president, president, which is like a whole second job, by the oh way. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're the, then you're the, uh, you know, previous past president, which still has its obligations. It's like a, it's like, um, you know, after you work out, you have to have a little routine afterwards and yeah. make sure the president's doing okay. Um, so that, that's a lot to take on in addition to being a father, being a husband and a business owner and a mogul. Um, so what, what's been the most satisfying thing about that type of, you know, time and effort spent for you with, uh, the VSOMS. Yes, sir. Um, I tell you what, you no one ever tells you when you first commit to the SOMS, uh, to an officer position that, Hey, this is a four year or a five year commitment, you know, and uh, I committed when I just had two kids and everything was going smooth. And now I got a third kid and then you know, I'm running around with my head and cut off. But, um, you know, I, 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 I really love this organization. It, it, it really helps, especially here in Virginia, um, keep our specialty in the forefront. It basically fights for our specialty, whether it's anesthesia rights, uh, insurance rights, um, uh, licensures. You know, and that's that's really kind of the gratifying part about being an officer is you get inside scoop of what's really going on with my profession. And I feel like what I'm really trying to do is trying to protect my profession, trying to protect my specialty here in Virginia. And so that's always gratifying. Yeah, it's key. It's key. And, you know, you do some education and some professional development yourself, Jesse. Why don't you tell tell us about that? Yeah, sure. I'm involved in a, in a couple of things. I'm actually uh, just became executive board on our county dental association. And so that's a five year track to president. So in, in five years, I'll be president of that. Um, so that's uh, relatively um, new. So congratulations. Um, looking forward to that commitment. Um and I'm sure I'll be um, struggling with the, the time commitment uh, once it gets down to it a few years from now. But now I'm, I'm happy with the decision. Um, so that'll be good. Uh, in addition to that, you know, as far as um, other things like we uh, talked about, um, you know, we, we do some lecturing and clubs um, for the uh, dentists and staff in our area. Uh, so we do that as a practice, um, probably five or six times a year. And that can, had been a pretty big group, uh, 150 or so, um, per, um, study club. And, uh, we did start that back up this fall, but, uh, we're kind of limited in space. So we're down to about 70 attendees and we've had two lectures this fall. Um, so we do that, which is a great way to get out there and talk to dentists and, and teach and educate and get feedback from them. Uh, in addition, uh, I lecture uh, at our local VA, has a general practice residency, um, and so I go there and lecture to their residents a year, then also um, still active um, with lecturing to um, some of the, the LECOM groups, which is, um, uh, LECOM is Lake Erie College of uh, Osteopathic uh, Medicine, which is has a branch down in Bradenton. And so I had taught at that school for um, the first two years I was out of residency. I was um, oral surgery program director there uh, for two years. And then um, I went full time at private practice, but I'm still involved with them. And I still have students that come up and shadow me uh, from the school as well. Um, so kind of a little bit all over the place with the education, but still, it's still nice to, to stay involved and, and to talk to people and, and teach. Gotcha. It's nice to help people, right? It's just fulfilling, giving back, you yeah. know, trying to say, hey, look out for these potholes too. Yeah. Do you ever get involved in the business conversations? Not necessarily, but they're, you know, the dental students are so focused on dentistry and oral surgery that, you know, the, the funny thing is like, I, I love finance. I love personal finance. I love tax law. I honestly, if I go back and teach again at, at LECOM, I would love to give them like a little mini finance course or business course or something like that uh, just to prepare them, you know, more than I was prepared because that's, you know, I'm I, really I think, into that. I, I think you so, should uh, for sure. I yeah, think that's a, that's yeah, a brilliant think, idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's on my radar for the, the future. So we'll see how things fold unfold. 
I, 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 and it's, this has just been my observation and this is anecdotal, but you know, there's kind of uh two schools, right. Uh, and I, I, don't, I say the new school, but the new school of, of doctor owners are, are certain, more entrepreneurial in, in mindset and spirit. They tend to be more, um, uh, they've done their research. They've done their homework. They, they you know, they have a, a, a pretty firm grasp of at least where they want to go. And they, they, they thirst for that knowledge and it'll just kind of go, look, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to do my work and I'm going to be the best at this. They, they, they understand that um, it's a, it's a business as well. Right. And so, yeah. like, and, you, and you guys are, are like this, the spear, the tip of the spear of that new school. You know, I think they, everyone carries so much more debt now that if you're not business minded, you'll never be able to tackle the half a million dollars in debt you're in after you're done with residency, you know? And, and so it, unfortunately it, it's an unfortunate slash fortunate consequence that you become business minded, um, you know, cause you need to. That's a really good point. Really good point. Absolutely. Frank, anything to add? No, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, you learn all the necessary tools that you need to be an oral surgeon when you come out of residency. You know, I think Jesse and I are just down to earth, generally nice guys. So we treat our patients well. We're always going to do the right thing. But what we've kind of learned over the years is that, hey, if you look at the trend of not just oral surgery, but dentistry, you know, dentistry is probably more ahead of our time than, than oral surgeons are. But, uh, you know, if you look at the trends of Google, uh, um, you know, out, 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 patient marketing, um, public marketing, uh, you really need to start having that kind of business mindset if you want to be successful in life or in su- successful in, in, in business. And just like Jesse said, our debt load these days is just astronomical that if you just sit back and just expect patients to come through your door because of your just your name and the way you treat people, it, 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 that, that's old times now. Or if you're extremely good looking like Frank Yeh. <laughs> do that. right is that what you do in uh in norfolk and virginia beach you just put it on big like billboards of your face frank oh man do you have billboards on my with my face on it or i'll just have signs on, on corners of the streets <laughs> <laughs> newspaper ads <laughs> you should you should do like you and your wife though you know yeah, I, yeah. I think you get better results that way go <laughs> <laughs> You're more good looking than I am. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I think the days are just hanging a shingle and, uh, you know, uh, being <laughs> fine is great. You know, hey, the people come in to me because I'm the I'm the doc. Um, like those days are gone. And, you know, there's been corporate or, you know, private equity money and in, in dentistry for a while. I um, got into specialist fairly recently within the past few years. And I'm sure you guys are, are somewhat aware of it, mm-hmm. um, neutral towards it. Um, you know, but there's it, one thing that I, you know, I've observed and I told a lot of clients this and I'm like, look, bud, it, if you just go out and go shake some hands and kiss some babies and make yourself available in the community, your local chamber of commerce, you know, maybe even if you don't like people, like, why don't you send somebody out there? You know, if you're not a good looking guy like Frank Gay or Jesse, you know, wait, go hire somebody that's very friendly and personable and have them go out and represent your practice um, because familiarity breeds trust, you know. And so, uh, you know, hey, your website's important. Uh, Google reviews are really important. But it's also, especially, you know, healthcare is always, it, it has remained and will be inherently local, in my opinion. You know, it's just healthcare is local. That's that. Um, well, you know, what do you think of that statement? Um, Frank, we'll go with you first. That healthcare is local. Absolutely agree. You know, absolutely agree. I think uh, you, 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 you make a name for yourself in your local community uh, by pre- treating patients right. I mean, external marketing, talking about external marketing, you know, you treat these patients right. They're going to tell their family members. Um, no family members will come to you. Um, but yeah, I think for sure. Uh, healthcare is always going to be a, a local thing. Just, if I'm understanding, your, if, I, if I'm understanding that question correctly, yeah. I mean, I was just kind of making a statement, so I'm, I guess not too much to comment on there. Jesse, would you like to add anything? No, no, I okay. agree. Fair enough. Um, what when you guys 
do you, is there anything special that you guys do besides, you know, Hey, we're an old surgery practice, but is there a niche that your practice does differently and or better than most people or most other oral surgery practices, you know, with all due respect, you know, what do you think sets you apart? And we'll go with Jesse first on this one. Sure. Um, you know, it's funny when I joined the practice, the practice name was Bay center for jaw surgery because before I had joined and well, before I joined, they weren't even doing orthognathic surgery anymore when I joined, but one of the big niches of the practice was orthognathic jaw surgery And over the years, we did less and less, and we did a lot more dental alveolar and implants. Um, And so pretty quickly after we I joined, we changed the name to Bay Center for Oral and Implant Surgery um, because it more accurately described what we were doing on a daily basis. Um, We're doing oral surgery, um, office-based oral surgery, and we're doing a lot of dental implants. And so, you know, not that implants is a niche to our practice because obviously a lot of practices do implants. Um, but more specifically within that niche and one of the things that I've, you know, grasped onto personally, um, are immediate implants. And I would say that's my niche within a niche. Um, you know, I place majority of the implants that I place are placed at the same time of the extraction. Um, and this is something, um, that I feel like I'm, well known for in the area that if somebody has a patient and they want to have the implant placed at the same time of the extraction, uh, they're going to send them to me because they know that I, if I can do, if it can be done, I will be able to do it. Um, And so I feel like that's something that I've, um, you know, grasped onto and I'm able to provide that, you know, for the referrals for the patient, you know, save them, you know, it's, it's less time uh, of a wait for healing. You know, you're looking at, you know, four or five months total versus eight or nine months total. You're looking at less surgery uh, if you can do everything at once and ultimately uh, a happier patient and a a happier uh, referral uh, if you can do that at the same success rate uh, and the same uh, results, uh, which I feel like I can. Uh, And so that's uh, kind of my my little thing that I do and I I really enjoy doing. Uh, It makes the cases slightly more complicated, but uh, I'm doing them all day every day. and, And so I love it. So can can I restate that in my my own words to make sure I understand? Yes, sir. So, so I'm the patient. What you're saying is, um, let's say I need I I need to have five teeth extracted out of my the lower portion of my mm-hmm. mouth. So I forget which mandibular is it the mandibular? Sure, mandible. Sure. Mandible. All right, the lower mandible. Um, I can have them extracted, and you're going to put implants in them. In the same day. Yeah. And, you know, obviously I I can't do it for everybody. So I'm clinically evaluating. I'm taking a CT scan on pretty much everybody uh, to see what the bone looks like, making sure there's no active infection, making sure there's adequate bone to get me primary stability on implants. Uh, And then a lot of times I'm at least immediately placing them. Now, this doesn't mean that they get teeth on them necessarily the same day. Uh, That would be immediate placement and immediate provisionalization, which we can do in some cases, um, but you need to have a very compliant patient for that. And so immediate placement means that I can take the tooth out, put the implant in and leave it in there for four months. And then they get a tooth back Um, at the end versus a more conventional way. You take the tooth out, you bone graft, you wait four months, uh, you reevaluate, you place an implant, you wait another four months, and then they get the tooth back. Uh, And so that's, you know, a conventional way to do it. Um, But majority of the time I'm taking a tooth out, I'm putting the implant in the same day. And in some cases I'm taking a tooth out, I'm putting the implant in and we're putting a provisional tooth on it the same day. Uh, So it just kind of varies um, on case by case, but I'm doing that more than half of the implants I place are that way. Well, that sounds like a whole lot of awesome as a consumer. So yeah because yeah. it's the one thing I can't make more of is time. Mm-hmm. So if I need something done, I, you know, I don't want to make, I don't want to wait four months and make a bunch of appointments. So the more we can knock it out, especially if we have a, an established high degree of quality, you know, that's, uh, that's attractive to, to busy people. Um, you know, I mean, everybody's busy, but as a business owner, um, time yeah. time's funny right i i think that's awesome i learned something new every day about oral surgery um I, I did not know that you had the extraction then you wait then you put in the screw implant but right 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah, to a layman, right? So there's, like a not, not, yeah. not all oral surgeons listen to this phone sure. or listen to the show. Tom Brady could be listening to the, to the program he, right he now. He is. Hey, I texted he's, him earlier, so he'll be listening. You're so doing, Antonio, Antonio yeah. Brown's listening to it too. Listen, you guys are doing a great job as a lifelong and, and long-suffering Buccaneers fan. Bravo. This is yeah, gonna, it's going to be an interesting year. That's for yeah. sure. Um, So, you know, but... So to us regular patients, it's a screw. I I got to pull it out. You're going to put a screw in there. And then what happens? I walk out with like screw mouth. like, like So, you know, everything's usually covered with tissue and bone when we're done. So you walk out, it looks like nothing happened. You look in there, you just see a hole where the tooth was. Um, it undergoes a phase called osteointegration, which means the bone fuses to the outside of the implant. Uh, it kind of becomes a part of your body. And that can take around four months or so. Um, and so it just sits in there usually, um, you know, if it's a front tooth, we get something temporary removable made that you can wear while it heals. If it's a back tooth, we kind of usually just leave it out and you just go without the tooth for four months. And Like Dracula teeth? Out. Could be. I mean, if you wanted it, we can make that happen, but usually normal teeth. Gotcha. Okay. Well, it's Halloween time. So, yeah. Um, all right. I, I didn't, I did not know that. So you have the interim. And then you come back and then you're putting on the top, the top, which I've seen many times, like Amos, you know, I've seen the demos and then you put the cap on, which looks better than my normal teeth, basically. Yeah, definitely. Definitely better than your teeth. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll be coming down there. I might need to stop by. I didn't know I could get it done that quick. I could do it over I'll Thanksgiving. It. Um, yeah. yeah, I definitely need to. Uh, I know sometimes clients look at my mouth and I'm like, Hey, eyes up here, buddy. Eyes up here. I see what you're looking at. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, you have a beautiful smile. You have well, a beautiful smile. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I don't want to be too pretty, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. so Frank, yay. Um, you can't, you can't use Jesse's. No. So you're going to have to come up with something else. that's cool about your practice. You got it. So no, we don't do it. We, we, we are, you're running uh, your typical um, wisdom teeth implants, dental extractions, but we don't do nearly the volume that Jesse does. I feel like our niche here in uh, our practice would be orthognathic surgery. And it's funny that I got into a practice that does a lot of orthognathic surgery, you know, in residency. Oh my gosh. I, I, that was not one. That was not a procedure I enjoyed. I don't know if you enjoyed it, Jesse, but Doing it down there at Nova, I did not like it. Um, took us eight hours to do a double draw. Um, so I got out of residency thinking I'm not going to do another orthognathic surgery, but things happen for a reason. I got into this office that does a lot. Um, we do probably about 10 to 12 double draws a year. And I have found that uh, I've grown to really enjoy it, to really like it, to, to, to change someone's life by just changing their smile, right? Just putting their jaws in a better position, correcting their bite, whether it's a bite problem, a TMJ problem. Some patients come to me and say, Hey, I have sleep problems. I have sleep apnea and I hate my CPAP. So let's do orthognathic surgery. Uh, and, And I find that procedure in itself to be very, very gratifying, very life changing. That's interesting. I've, I've heard that. So orthognathic surgery from what I've been told from, we have a lot of oral surgery clients. It's very satisfying. And it's also complex and very labor and time intensive. You have to create models. You know, it, this is not a small procedure uh, at all. Right. Oh. My, no. And, but it's, and it's not one of the things it's a high frequency. So from a, and I'm an insurance guy, you know, it's not something that shows up in a claims report um, as, uh, you know, a spike claim or something that has a high degree of of, of cost risk. Um, and so it doesn't get much of a second thought, um, really. So the people that are doing the underwriting on it in medical, they're dealing with dialysis, they're dealing with, you know, chronic conditions, they're dealing with, you know, you're, it's not millions, it's billions of dollars, you know. And so orthognactic doesn't get the really time and consideration that it deserves. And then they don't have the time to, you know, compensate folks 
uh, appropriately. So for those of my uh, insurance friends uh, that are listening to the show, hello. And uh, there, there you go. There's some work to do on orthognathic. I realize it's not a slice of the healthcare cost by, um, but it does make a difference in patients' lives. And I've heard this from several oral surgeons across the country and they struggle with it. They stop doing orthognathic surgery because the reimbursements are so awful. Um, they just can't afford to do put in the time labor to do it right, which is sad. Absolutely. That's one of the biggest downfalls of orthognathic surgery. That's why oral surgeons don't really want to do it. Um, let's face it. You spend about five or six hours in a hospital to do a procedure, take on higher risks, where you can probably just stay in the office and do two or three sets of wisdom teeth and make the same amount of money and take the lower risks. Um, but here in our practice, you know, we feel like we want to offer that service to our, our patients, not just to our patients, but to our orthodontists. You know, we know that not all patients can be corrected with braces or just Invisalign. So we want to provide that service to them. Excellent point. I think that's, that's very noble. Um, of you, and you're probably one of the very few that do that in the greater Virginia Beach, Norfolk area, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Um, what are you guys seeing out there that is troublesome or that you're keep, causing you to sleep, you lose sleep at night? Jesse, we'll go to you. Um, I would say in, in general, from a, a business standpoint and not from COVID or from the election or things of that nature, but from a business standpoint, uh, the expansion of DSOs, um, you know, buying private practices and, you know, converting, um, you know, just in the seven years I've been in practice here, I, I think there's between our three offices, there's maybe around 200 practices that could refer to us that are in our, in our, in our area. And I would say over seven years, I've seen close to 10% of those sell out and be bought out by a DSO. That's, you know, even if it's a smaller one where they only have, you know, four or five locations, you know, in seven years, seeing, you know, almost, you know, probably around 10% or close to 10% of private practices not being private practices anymore, you know, it's a disturbing trend. Um, you know, that ultimately, you know, from a specialist standpoint, you know, you say, well, why does that matter to you? Well, you know, obviously there's less people referring us patients. Um, you know, I don't know if people know this, but most of a DSO's model is to keep all procedures within the practice. And that usually means that they are hiring an outside oral surgeon or periodontist to come in to their four or five locations and do all of the oral surgery and someone else to do all of the, um, perio and someone else to do all the endo. So they have their own specialists. And mm -hmm. so, you know, although DSOs aren't buying specialty practices, they don't want to, they don't need to, they want to buy dental offices and then put specialists inside of them and increase revenue secondary to that. And so that's, you know, probably the big, biggest threat out there, um, you know, to a private practice, not just oral surgeon, but specialists in general is as more dentists get bought out by DSOs, there's going to be less and less patients referred out to us, you know, and if I saw 10% go in seven years, you know, does that mean in, you know, within 70 years that everything's going to be DSO, you know, probably not, but uh, you see where the trend is going. Mm -hmm. And so there, what, what's your observation? Would they bring in spe specials in house or they have the general dentist to the implants and put people to sleep or, both. Are they, are they getting a kid that's got a half a million dollars in debt and having them run to, you know, six practices all over Pinellas, Hillsborough, um, Hernando, Pasco counties? Yeah, I mean, some of them will try to get the dentist to do as much as they possibly can, you know. So if the dentist can do implants, if the dentist is going to, you know, take a weekend sedation course, you know, different things like that. Um, they might try to do that. And then, like I said, a lot of them will hire, you know, somebody, a specialist to come in and do the specialty treatment that needs to be done uh, and not refer that out. Can I learn to put people to sleep in a weekend? Quote unquote, yes, you can. <laughs> there are courses out there you can do it in a weekend. Um, that, I could, right? That's disturbing. Well, not you, but 
Um, you know, there are courses for general that is, so Frank and I went to residency for four years where we were sedating people on a daily basis for four years where we were doing a four month rotation in an OR with an anesthesiologist doing intubating patients and sedating patients and this four year process to get to where we are. And they do, you know, that's where our training came from. That's how we learned how to sedate patients safely. Um, and there are options for people who don't go that route to do continuing education courses and get certified in conscious sedation as a general dentist or as a different specialist. Um, you know, so you can undergo that training and get a permit for conscious sedation as a general dentist. Yes. Got it. All right. So somebody who's not a doctor, I don't have any healthcare background. I can't do it. So you still, still have to, to become a doctor off. first and then take the weekend course. Well, being a doctor would make my mom real proud. Hi mom. Um, <laughs> But uh, not not my not the, not the stars for me. Um, okay, so well that that makes me feel a little bit better. Um, you know, I was like, what can I learn in a weekend? Right, get a rubber mallet. <laughs> I know how to do that now, anyway. But I don't know what the actual healthcare outcome would be. <laughs> um, so, uh, all right, so that makes sense. Um, and so, if they're building, it, you know, they're keeping everything in house. Um, I can see that. And so not really any solution there except for to be vigilant and make sure you do a good job. And, you know, luckily you're in a pretty good market and you've got a mean, well-oiled machine going on. Um, Frank, is, is it the same thing for you or is there anything else keeping you up at night besides COVID, the election, your kids and corporate dentistry buying up all of your referring general dentist practices yeah you know so we got dso here too and for uh tom brady if you're listening dso's are just basically um business ventures you know non-dentists these businessmen who are going out and buying dental practice to, to put to put their on their por- portfolio so the difference in that mindset is hey their business first and then patient care second. Whereas, you know, you just see it now, we're always about patient care first. Yeah, we're business minded folks, but we're about patient care first. Then we're about the business. Um, we got DSO here in the area as well. They're kind of getting big. Um, I, I think um, my CPA once told me uh, you either going to get some come to it or you play their game. And hence I went ahead and bought another oral surgery and bought out his office. And I might consider doing that here in the near future. Um, not so much to have the same business model. It's just to have a bigger presence in their area, right? Less, less, less to worry about if, if DSO is coming in and, and, and taking up all these dental offices. Mark but power. I, market power. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But I think what really keeps me up at night, uh, is um, I, I texted you a couple of days ago where we got this nice little postcard from one of our insurance uh, carriers that said, hey, uh, we got a deal for you. We're going to get some new patients for you. New mm-hmm. patients. New hey, patients. Great right? news, new patients. New patients. It's always new patients. That's bad yeah, news, baby. I'm like, I'm sold. Well, we go online and find out our fee schedule has been decreased about 10 to 15%. And it is so uh, more demoralizing because after COVID, as offices, I know, Jesse, you're the same way. We've taken on more expenses with PPEs, uh, gloves and gowns. Have, their, their prices have gone up. Um, medical supplies have gone up. Med- medications have gone up. Um, you know, f- to run a business, everything has gone up. And now to hear that insurance companies kind of reimburse you less and less. Um, that's, what's really disheartening. Uh, and that's what really keeps me up at night. Well, uh, that would make two of us, <laughs> um, you know, thank you for bringing that up. It's actually, it's something that we're trying to get the word out, you know, to those, uh, my friends, colleagues in the insurance industry who may be listening to this, this is the challenge, right? So I can see Frank right now on his beautiful face. And so, you know, you guys can't see his face. You guys are all in boardrooms. You're making decisions. And I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed in, in, in some of us 
us being the insurance industry that, uh, you know, I figured that COVID would kind of bring us all together and we'd be somewhat reasonable um, and not use it as an opportunity to, um, you know, I get it. Hey, it's business. You got to control your cost of care. We see an opportunity that we can bring our cost of care down for years to come. I get it. At the same time, you got business owners that are out there that are doing the best that they can and they're buying all of this equipment and um, it's not like they're charging your full fee um, familiar with the contracts. Um, the discount is fair. And so now we're going to slice them even more. Um, I, you know, I really think that, and I'm sure to be fair to everybody and respectful. Um, I know that there's two camps in that boardroom. I know there is. And there's one camp that says we got to do what we got to do. And the other camp is like, you know what? Our product here is the doctors. It is the network. And the only thing, the last thing I will say to all of you who are listening, you can only tax the people so much before they throw your metaphorical tea into the harbor. And I will leave the rest of the conversations to be in private. Um, but thank you very much, Frank, for that. Um, that definitely keeps me up at night. Um, there, there's not the, just one carrier right now. There's a couple of them. And some of them, like, all, you know, to be fair, carriers are all different. They're not all doing the same thing. Some carriers are doing really awesome things, helping out the provider community, helping out the member community, helping out their own local communities. And some of them are using this as an opportunity to um, be unfair. And I'm being as polite, polite as I can. Um, so um, with that, um, let's see here. What else do we want to talk about? What is unique about the Virginia Beach ecosystem? You know, um, your market there. What do you like? What do you love about Virginia Beach and Norfolk? Oh my gosh. So, uh, you know, at first I had no ties to Virginia beach whatsoever. I, I, I'm a Pennsylvania guy. So I grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, um, went to Pittsburgh for, for eight years for undergrad in dental school. And then I moved down to Fort Lauderdale for oral surgery training. Uh, when I got out, I realized, man, Fort Lauderdale is too damn hot. Pennsylvania, <laughs> too damn cold. You know? So I literally, took a map and I told my wife, I was my fiance at the time. I said, listen, let's look on the map, Virginia beach, North Carolina, They're in the middle between Pennsylvania and Florida. So that's gotta be the best of both worlds. So we took a shot and came up here and uh, we've been up here for seven years now. We just love it. So uh, living in Virginia beach, I mean, we got obviously the beach and you want to go to the beach. It's, it's right down the road, but, but Hey, if I'm tired of the beach, I want the mountains. I drive three or four hours west of here past Richmond to Charlottesville. I got the mountains. Uh, if I want to go to DC, it's a four hour drive up north of DC. Um, so it's got a little bit of everything here. Uh, great community to raise kids. Um, there's a lot of, um, cool events and farms and that, that, that kids love up here. So from a, from a community standpoint, we just, we just love it up here. So much to do. It's awesome. I, I like that area too. And being from Florida, it is too hot. That's why I'm here. It but is, yeah. And then you got to keep it going north and there's snow. Uh, yeah, I can't. No, I, no, this is far north as we're going to get. Um, my wife's also a native Floridian from uh, from Broward County. She's East Coast Florida. I'm West Coast Florida. There is a difference um, for those of us that are Floridians. No. Um, Jesse, are, are you a native Floridian? Are you from, are you from the Sunshine? No, I'm from Wisconsin. Okay. So you got down, you're like, holy smokes, no snow. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah. So um, I did move to Florida just with the thought of getting out of Wisconsin for a while. And then that I would go back to Wisconsin where my dad was a dentist and I would join his practice and the rest would be history. Um, that being said, I ended up in dental school, decided I wanted to do oral surgery. Um, also met my wife who is from Clearwater, Florida. And so, um, we set our sights on the West coast, um, after residency, uh, ended up in St. Petersburg, um, West coast of Florida, you mean? 
west coast of Florida, correct? And you're, <laughs> you're right. There is a, a difference. You know, the uh, the east coast and particularly Fort Lauderdale, Miami, people are not as nice as they are in the St. Petersburg area. I will leave it at that. Um, you know, so we ended up in St. Pete, um, closer to her family. And, you know, same thing. I love it here. Summers are hot. Okay. But, you know, right now, you know, for the next eight months, it's going to be beautiful here. Um, you know, just get out on the water. You know, I love fishing and we're going to be doing the, the big King of the Beach uh, Kingfish tournaments this weekend. So I'll be doing that Sweet. Uh, with some friends, which will be fun. And, you know, we'll be fishing while everybody else is shoveling. So, um, you know, we got that going for us. Yep. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming back home. It's gotten, gotten cold all of a sudden. I'm like, okay, all right, we're going back, back to Tampa for a little bit. Um, <laughs> my son loves fishing. It's the only thing he loves more than video games. I don't know. Like he just digs it. He watches like fishing shows and stuff too. So like every chance I could get to, you know, take him out fishing. He digs oh, it. Awesome. Yeah. And he's not like not hating me for pulling them off of the video games or making them play basketball or something. Um, so yeah, this is the time of year where I really miss Florida. Um, and you know, sometimes people call me like from Cleveland or even Wisconsin and they're like, Hey Pat, will you come, you know, non COVID times, will you come speak at our study club or our meeting? And I'm like, uh, in February. Mm -mm. No, Mm -mm. I, I don't, I don't own the clothes that would get me like from the airport into the car and like get around safely without freezing to death. I don't think, right. You gotta have special clothes and underwear. Um, so those of you that are up yeah. north, God bless you. Um, I really hope that you are uh, enjoying this show. Um, we're not judging, just saying that you guys have it harder and so you're tougher. Rock on. Um, let's see here. So before we wrap this program up, um, is there anybody that you would like to uh, give special mentions to? We've already talked about the society or the Virginia Society for Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons. Laura Givens, how are you? Uh, the Florida Society for Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons. Hank, how are you? The Florida Dental Association. I'll give a little shout out to Mike Bam down there, the association partner. I'll send this to you. Um, I'd also like to say um, hello to the Cavicles family, Aparicio, um, Michaela Munez, Mike Cole in Tampa, Argus Dental, the Zambrano family, my family, everybody in Tampa. I'll be coming back soon. Um, Anybody you'd like to say hello to that do you say thank you for your support from um, Frank go with you. Uh, I just want to thank, first of all, Jesse, actually, really, he was the guy who introduced me to you. Um, uh, so thank you, Jesse, for hooking me up with Patrick. He's done wonders here uh, in our office uh, in the past two or three years since that uh, we've, we've really got to know one another. Um Really, more importantly, I just want to thank my um, oral surgery program uh, professors, my, my attendings out there, Dr. Coleman, Dr. McClure, Dr. Lopez. I mean, you guys are the ones who are uh, we're, they're the reasons why we're capable of doing what we, we can do, uh, teaching us the necessary tools and lessons that we can go and treat patients. So thank you to them. I like that. Jesse, you're up. Sure, sure. Well, uh, thank you, Patrick, for having us on your show. I appreciate that. And uh, uh, Frankie for helping uh, make that happen as well. And uh, same shout out to uh, Nova Southeastern University and our, our faculty there. Um, you know, they provided us with a great education and gave us the building blocks um, to build on for uh, what we've become today. Um, you know, obviously my wife and, and kids as well for uh, supporting me through, uh, you know, my education in my career um you know and then my partners at the practice for just giving me the opportunity to join and um really uh join something special here in pinellas terrific i'd like to thank both of you for, not just for being guests but for your confidence and you know your business place and practice quotient uh I pretty sure you guys are happy with it i appreciate your referrals and all the nice things that you say about me in public and private um 
And I'd also like to thank John Ray and all the team at Business Radio X Studios for making things happen. They do a great job producing the show. And, of course, we need to thank our sponsor, Practice Quotient, PPO Negotiation and Analysis, a national firm that specializes in strategic guidance on all of your PPO, DHMO, and EPO contracts. You need to talk to an expert when the stakes are high. So uh, thank you very much to Practice Quotient and everybody on the Practice Quotient team, Scotty and Nikki. Hello, you guys do a great job. Thank you very much. Um, so with that, this is your host, Patrick O'Rourke with Dental Business Radio with the Young Guns of OMS signing off. Until next time.